Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today, our education session, Be Prepared Before Disaster Strikes. I'm Pat Jackson. I'm SUMA's newest, I won't say youngest, director for the Southeast Region. I'm deputy mayor for the town of Kipling. Now, before we get into the session, I want to quickly note the emergency exits, and you're going to be hearing this repeatedly, all for the next three days. If you look on pages 24 and 25 in the book that, I'm gonna stand back, this thing is loud. If you look in your convention 2018 handbook on 24 and 25, you'll see everything marked. Just take a, a quick look at it so that in the horrid event that something were to happen, you would know where to go. You'll be told this repeatedly because keeping this place safe is important. The session is being audio recorded. That means if you wish, when it comes time for question and answer, if you wish to ask a question, please come to the microphone. That way, everyone else in the room can hear what you're asking, and so can our speaker, which means he can answer what you're asking. Later in the month, all of the presentations will be available on the SUMA YouTube channel. So we want the recordings to be a good resource for you, but also perhaps for others in your, on your council or from communities that don't come to this session. When events are being planned for these education sessions, there is an attempt made to get a broad range of speakers. Full bios are available on the event base where you can see all the work that these people have done to prepare themselves to be able to teach us something. Give them your full attention. Give our speaker today your, good of, your full attention so that you can take in the things that may benefit your community. It might be very different things from what someone else sees as being, as being beneficial, but there's nothing wrong with that. This session is sponsored by Chappelle, and we have Kaylee Stewart, account manager, here on their behalf to introduce our speaker. Please show our thanks for sponsoring this session. Thanks, Pat. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm very excited to be here. This is my first SUMA conference, so the scale of this is amazing. Um, I'm with Chappelle. We are the Employee and Family Assistance Program provider uh, through the SUMA Extended Benefits Plan. So we provide clinical counseling, overall sort of health and wellness support, and then on-site critical incident support. So I'm very uh, happy to be here and to introduce uh, Ray Unrau. Uh, Ray began working as an ambulance emergency medical technician in 1982 and became a paramedic in 1987. He changed careers and began working for the Saskatoon Fire Department in 1993 as a firefighter, later transferring into the department's training division to instruct the EMS program and eventually the tech technical rescue program. In 2002, he took the position as Saskatoon's Director of Emergency Measures Planning. In July of 2017, Ray left the city of Saskatoon to come work for emergency management and fire safety, filling the position of Deputy Fire Commissioner, Director of Operations. Please welcome Ray. Great. Uh, I will. I think you probably need me to be behind the mic because it's a big room. So typically I try to wander, so if I look like I'm a little bit ADHD, it's because I'm typically wandering off into the corner. So I'll do my best to stay here. Um, just a question, do we have video or sort of sound for a video that I have on the computer? Excellent. Not that it's a critical thing, but just wanted to know where we were going to be at with that. All right, well, thank you very much for taking the time to spend with us talking about emergency planning. Um, it typically is difficult to get people engaged in the topic and a lot of times when we think about emergency planning we're thinking about that one big grand slam move that that we can pull if we just spent a million dollars we could have X and if we had X we'd have no problems I think one of the one of the things that we subconsciously do 
to make that grand slam move is look at insurance and we think, well, we have insurance and so we're covered. I think insurance definitely plays a role within the emergency planning spectrum, but insurance is not your go-to move. So we need to really kind of dial back from the kind of the mopping up where we're at with, uh, with the effects of emergencies and think about what we can do before the emergency occurs, what we can do during the emergency, and certainly what we can do after the emergency. And you can see the um, little thing there. It should be a, just a, a cut and paste from your, uh, from your program. And I looked at that after uh, Sean put that up, and I wasn't very helpful to Sean from SUMA when he said, what are you going to talk about? I think I was a little bit late in my responses. So he made some stuff up, which I think is useful. But I can't even imagine how to start covering all those things in about an hour and a half. So, you know, the, the comforting thing for me as a speaker is the more broad the, um, um, the, the, uh, the topic, the more broad my, my uh, uh, the more broad, the more strategic that my thinking is. So it's pretty easy for me to fit stuff into that. But we certainly will cover that. We'll talk about what council administrations can do, but I don't just want to say council administrations. I don't just want to focus on fire departments. I want to focus on you as individuals. So we're going to talk about kind of all those things and wrap them up into that particular topic. Let's see if this works. Perfect. How we're going to do that is we're going to drive um, that, that big concept, that, that big how, what can we do to make ourselves safer, into three basic categories. We're going to talk about recognizing the risks, and I think we've all kind of done some of that a little bit. We do that every day when we go to work. We do that every day when we get up. But in this concept of emergency planning, what do we do to recognize the risks? And I think I'm going to take a bit of a different approach than maybe what you're used to hearing, so please uh, kind of tune in for that. Talk about community support. I think one of the easiest things that we think about is the people in uniform are our first responders and the people in uniform are going to take care of this for us. It's not the case. We're going to talk about community uh, support, not just about first responder or re uh, supporting the first responders, but what the community can do to be participatory in an emergency and after an emergency. And then we'll wrap it up with some options that you can do to train and practice. We're not going to get into those things. I'll kind of leave it just with uh, some kind of some bullet points that you can take away about the different types of training that, that you can participate in. But if you have any questions or comments about those training programs, I can answer those questions for you today. So over the next 90 minutes, we're going to talk about uh, these three things and how they can support you as a council administration and your community to be prepared. And if anybody has any questions as we're going, I know it's a little bit inconvenient to kind of use the mic, but uh, if you don't want to walk up to the mic while we're in session and you have a question, just raise your hand. If you can tell me what your question is, I'll regurgitate your question into the mic and I'll try to answer it. I don't like just these one-way conversations. I feel very uncomfortable. I've been married for 35 years. I'm used to listening more than talking, so um, <laughs> I would appreciate a little bit of dialogue. That would be very helpful. All right, so when we talk about recognizing risks, I think we don't just dial into, we can't just dive into plane crashes and uh, um, power outages and water outages. That's easy. That's low-hanging fruit. I think what we have to do is step back a little bit and say when we're talking about risks, what's the, what's the definition in terms of an emergency risk and a disaster risk? And those are apple and oranges. When we think about emergencies and disasters, we've got to be able to pull those apart because if we can't pull those apart, that's where your community is going to fall down. Right now, your communities are well served and your communities are well, uh, well enabled and they have the capacity to deal with emergencies. What we're talking about today is disasters, and the two are very separate. We need to know what those are. Then we'll talk a little bit about some risks in your community. So with our first kind of our link in the chain we're going to talk about today is recognition. So let's talk about recognizing emergencies versus disasters. And I have three different definitions there that I want to kind of dive into. I'm not sure if you can see everything there, but I've tried to highlight what I think is really important. So there's a picture of a kind of a flood that occurred in Saskatoon just off to the side. There's a lot of low income housing. Those people had to leave. They were out of their homes for a number of weeks, if not a month or so. Uh, there was a business that was impacted. The people definitely couldn't drive to and from work uh, using that particular intersection. So that was definitely something that was unusual. But for the most part, how the city of Saskatoon or this, this community in, in particular, how they were able to react to this was with the resources that they had available. On staff utility folks, on staff fire, on staff police, the Red Cross that was available. So don't worry about getting trapped up. Well, my community doesn't have all those things. Your, the emergency that occurs in your community is based on the level of resources that you have. So if you have three fire trucks, only need two fire trucks, that's an emergency. So when we're talking about an emergency, it's an event that requires prompt coordination. Yeah, you pay taxes for that. You've got people in your fire departments and police departments and ambulance services and your town uh, utility folks that have the equipment that they need 
to respond promptly, and they can, for the most part, coordinate efficiently to deal with the issues of personal safety, property, and, uh, property health issues, welfare, all those um, other, other sorts of things in there. So an emergency requires prompt coordination, but it really relies on prompt coordination for the tools that you already have. Okay, so this is just taking what you already have, throwing them at the problem, and for the most part, being able to manage that particular problem. That can be shown, let's just look at the org chart first, and this is where I tend to try to wander. Um, is the red button, is that a laser or is that backwards? You don't know, okay, I'm not gonna take a chance. So if you look at the org chart from the top on down before I jump into the actual disaster, you see that the top box says the emergency happens. Whoever has kind of recognized the emergency calls 911. So that could be the, uh, a citizen calls 911, that could be the person having the emergency calls 911. Whoever calls 911, doesn't much matter, but the call is made. Then the call goes to what's called the PSAP, a public safety answering point. So most of the province, the PSAP is up in Prince Albert, so they'll call Prince Albert and say, I've got X, this is happening, and then this is a bit of unusual, or this is an emergency for me. And so the PSAP will then dispatch fire, police, and EMS, or they'll pick the one of the organizations that's most, uh, uh, most uh, uh, suitable for that response, or they'll send all three. But that's your typical emergency that when I worked in the city of Saskatoon, you'd go to those dozens of times a day. Those are just normal emergencies. Something happens, someone calls, resources are sent, resources go, resources deal with the issue, put the issue to bed, everybody goes home, and then the person who calls and who called the emergency ends up with kind of the aftermath, so maybe you know uh, the Chappelle folks are going to come in with schism or whatever. Uh, but the but the emergency is dealt with. When we're talking about disaster, it doesn't stop there. So a disaster is defined as an abnormal situation. We consider car accidents to be normal. We consider house fires to be normal. In the emergency world, those are normal. That's what you pay us for. That's what we're equipped to do. So for us. That's a, a normal situation. For you, that may be abnormal, but we're talking about the system. So a disaster is defined as an abnormal situation that, de that demands prompt, coordinated action, this is also important, that exceed normal procedures. So this is the situation that the fire guy gets on site and there is water bubbling up out of the basement. As a fire guy, I can't really help you with that. I can help you manage some of the impacts of that, but I can't help you with the water coming out of the basement. Or I get to, the, get to the site of the emergency and the building is crooked, it looks like it's unsafe. I can help you get out of the building, but I can't do anything about the building. So these are, disasters are things that exceed normal procedures. I, as a fire or an EMS person or a police officer, we can't deal with that. Or I'm a public works guy, I can't, I can't deal with that. So what I need to do is I need to be able to, to reach past my normal procedures, my normal daily operating procedures, the normal equipment that I have on my truck is not going to be enough for this particular event. So that's what we call a disaster. So now some examples of disaster would be more than the usual number of people. So if we have a, um, and it probably isn't very comforting for you to know, but most emergency capacities are, you know, they're almost at maximum right now. So if you threw 10 critical people into the city of Regina or the city of Saskatoon or the city of Moose Jaw or Battleford, you'd probably be throwing that particular system into chaos. So we're talking about a large number of people, and the number of people we're talking about is really relative. If we're talking about evacuations, the city of Saskatoon, well, let's use the city of Regina. Right now, I bet you're all chewing up all the hotel space in, in Regina, and if we had to evacuate a, a nearby community, Regina would hardly be able to handle that extra um, hotel capacity. We, we battle with that every year. Where is the hotel capacity for displaced people? Whether they're inside our community or outside the community, it doesn't matter. There's only so many hotel rooms. So you get past that certain number for that, for that particular context, and you're in a disaster. You're in a, you're in a situation that's abnormal. You can't you don't have enough housing space or whatever the case may be. So an abnormal number of people, that, that needle kind of moves around depending on the, on the community you're talking about and the time of year you're talking about, but it's, it's more than you can handle at that particular time. Maybe you're using more than, enough, more than the usual number of resources and we think, okay, well as fire guys, we have mutual aid. Well, that's all well and good. You've got mutual aid. But when we're talking about mutual aid, for a fire or an emergency that doesn't last very long, that's when mutual aid works really well. But when you're talking about an emergency that's gonna last for five or six or seven days, that mutual aid has to go back to their community at some point in time. And if that mutual aid partner is in your community and they have an emergency back in their organization, now what do you do? 
you were counting on them to be there, but they got their own business to handle. So we're talking about situations that are abnormal. We plan for mutual aid, never thinking that that next thing is going to drop. We don't want to be chicken little and over plan. You know, you get to that point where we're planning for meteorite showers and we're planning for, for boa constrictor invasions. Like, that's ridiculous. You've got to, you know, draw a line somewhere. But at the same point in time, you have to have a system that can somehow look at those challenges and problems in real time and make sure everybody understands them and you know where to reach out that you weren't necessarily planning for, but you've got a backup system. So definitions exceed, sorry, um, disasters exceed normal procedures and people and the number of resources and then maybe the impacts on the community. So the, um, you probably can't read this, I would imagine you'll get the slide deck available to you, um, but the definition comes from Public Safety Canada. Um, I didn't realize that when I, I, I took a master's degree in emergency planning, it was a useless two years, <laughs> because <laughs> you can learn on the job. Um, but uh, what I learned in that, in that two year process was there's about a thousand different definitions of disaster. Every sociologist that wants to come in and study disaster will come up with a different definition. And there's definitions that range back as, as late as, I think we're in the wrong room. We should be in the room with the music. I think we should all pick up and go. Definitions as far back as the, as the 40s and definitions that are certainly being reinvented today. But the one thing that all these definitions of disaster is not, a, not this one here, but the one thing that they all have in common is that a disaster is really about disrupting the routine of your, of your community. And that can be something as silly as not being able to drive right to your school. You've got to take, go four blocks out of the way. It's a really low-level disaster, but for some people, when they're at the maximum of their patience, that could be that's just the thing that drops the wheels off. So anything in your community that disrupts the, the routine is considered a disaster or can be within the, 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 the definition of disaster. And I would suggest to you that we think about that long and hard. Any elected officials in the room? Okay. So you can put your hands down. Anybody who in the room that's got jobs that are affected by decisions of elected officials? You can, all the rest of you can raise your hands, yeah. So what we have in today's day and age is we have people that have, I'm um, not sure if I have one on me, sure I do. And as soon as something doesn't go right, I'm gonna flip my camera on, I'm gonna take a picture, I'm gonna put it to my Instagram, my Facebook, my Twitter account, and I'm gonna complain because it wasn't what I was expecting. And someone's gonna have to fix that. So while that isn't really a disaster, we don't have to treat public dissatisfaction as a disaster. We have to recognize that the things that people are dissatisfied with, with are things that disrupt their routine and you keep compounding the ability for them to complain in public and, and express the issues that are, that are occurring. Um, we need to react to that somehow. And I think that um, within the city of Saskatoon, within the province of Saskatchewan, we were both taking the same approach that we don't want to react to people's dissatisfaction and let the, the, you know, the, the cart drive the horse, certainly not. But at the same point in time, we have to take that with a bit of, we have to take that with a bit of gravity. There's a bit of weight behind that. We need to think about that. And my new boss says, we don't, um, uh, we're not emergency managers, we manage emergencies. I think that's a kind of a subtle difference, but it is an important difference. I think we all need to start thinking about managing emergencies rather than emergency management. Because if you manage emergencies, then you can start to say school disruptions. You can start to say the um, Garth Brooks concert. You can start to say, you know, a large downtown events that disrupt something. You can start to look at the world differently. You don't have to plan for more. You, have, you should have a system that should be able to accept that. It's just how you actually kind of prepare yourselves. I don't want to get too deep into that. I wasn't planning on talking about that. It's kind of my mind wandered. So if you have any questions about that, we can certainly talk about that later. But definitions of disasters and definitions of emergencies matter. So a disaster, sorry, an emergency is, you know, prompt coordination is needed, but you reach into your toolbox and the stuff is there. That's what you pay your folks for, for day-to-day -day emergencies. Emergencies for you, routine stuff for us. The other way to look at emergencies is when your first responders get on site and their eyes are like this, they're not prepared to deal with that. That's probably a good indication that, that you're dealing with something that's a little bit next level. So uh, disasters are defined as abnormal situations, but they exceed normal procedures, and the normal procedures even above things like mutual aid. So let's use that flow chart and kind of bring that one step further. Uh, so where you can kind of see those three little diamond boxes, that's where it ended on the previous slide. So, so what? So you, you might be asking, so what if it's a disaster? This is critical. This is, a, this is kind of a, for my little talk here, this is a watershed moment for my little talk. When your fire and police and ambulance get on site and they realize that this is an abnormal situation that requires prompt coordination, what do they do? 
I want you to ask yourself, who do they call? I want you to challenge yourself, when that person that they call for help, what do they do? That's the nub of emergency management right there. Because I can tell you right now, I've been involved in emergency services since 1982. I've been teaching emergency services, uh, different programs for about 20, 25 years. And we never, ever, in our standard in CPR, auto extrication, building collapse, we never approach an emergency in a way that we can't handle it. We have a blind spot. We teach ourselves that we can handle anything that the community can throw at us. And all we do after that is it's a frog in boiling water. We get onto a call that is, exceeds our capacity and we have not taken specific training to let us know who do we reach out to help or for help. And Cor was, I was talking to Cor Lobies, uh, kind of a longtime colleague, um, talking about how there's this misunderstanding between fire and, e and EM and emergency management services. Where do you fit in? That's the level where you have to figure it out. When does the fire captain or the fire chief get onto a situation that exceeds normal capacity? What, does the, what are the trigger points for that? And how and when and who do they call and what can they expect after that call? So I can tell you who. When your fire chief or RCMP officer or whoever you have in your town that responds to something and they recognize the, the signs that this is abnormal and it's going to ex exceed normal uh, capacity, they should know to reach out to your emergency coordinator or someone that can activate that. That's number one. If you want to know how you can make your community better? Figure out that interface right there. How do you do that? Who's going to take that? All right, so now you've got this volunteer in your town that's your EM coordinator and the elected officials that raised your hand and remember who you are. That elected, that EMO coordinator who's a volunteer has to reach out to somebody. Is that you? Is that somebody else? Is that the administrator? Who's that person going to reach out to? So once the police, fire, and EMS have recognized that they're about just about water level in terms of uh, what, what they can handle, they reach out to the EM coordinator. The EM coordinator looks at their plan, says, oh, that's page 14. I got that. No problem. I'll call this person. Who is that person? Because that person in your town most likely doesn't have any authority to make decisions. They have the authority to make the plan. They have the authority to kind of bring committees together. But they don't have authorities to make decisions. So they're going to need someone to be able to do that. So they would reach out to administrators, elected officials, and once those people are kind of on board, or their committee, once those people are on board, they can start to, so that's the middle box on the, on the bottom of the three, um, the elected officials, they could reach out to Public Safety 911, so that would be my organization. You want help? Make the call for help. The earlier you call us, the faster we can get there with equipment and capacity. Or maybe you need to get your committee together to open up your EOC, your Emergency Operations Center. All the rest of that stuff, and then from your EOC, you would notify residents of the community if you had to with SASC alert or maybe, you know, I shouldn't laugh because I'm being recorded, but maybe there's a nuclear threat coming from North Korea that you just have this itch to push the button. So uh, we, have a new, we have new challenges nowadays. We've got to be very careful about how we, how we push the SASC alert button. I don't think we ever not want to push it. We should want to push it, but we have to be very careful about the message that, that we send. So your emergency operations center uh, operations team could notify the residents of the community or could then start to open up uh, these, these more robust mutual aid um, partnerships. But when we're talking about that middle piece, the elected officials and, and administrators, um, what are you going to be telling them? I'm not going to wake up the mayor of my town and say, hey, Bob the fire chief just called me and says it's bad. What's bad? Where is it bad? What could happen if it's bad? And that's common sense, sitting in a nice sterile environment like this where we're not really challenged with time constraints and we're not worried about you know, people becoming injured or more of the emergency expanding. It's easy to say, well, of course I would call the mayor and the elected officials and give them that information. That's not that easy. Your volunteer fire chief or whoever's on the scene has a job to do and they're busy doing that job. So need, they need to be trained, that's my point. They need to be trained when to activate the next level, when do they notify the coordinator? They need to be trained, okay, whew, take a pause, this is bad, it exceeds normal procedures, I've got to open up EMO, what do I need to tell EMO? So now EMO now has a, a clear picture of what's going on and they can start activating the, the system as per the plan, as per the plan everyone has agreed to in, their, in your planning phase. But my point with this slide is, right where those three boxes turn into that big EM coordinator, we don't train for that. You can have all the plans you want after that. You can have, 
I've seen small communities in BC, community of 1,000 people, and they have emergency plans that are 250 pages deep. Cut, copy, paste, cut, 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 copy, paste. Looks good on a desk, doesn't work so good in real life. If you want to do one thing today, challenge yourself. How does, when does fire, EMS, and police contact EM, and what is that message they're going to give them? You want to do that, you'll make your system better immediately overnight. Nobody's getting up to the mic. Any questions? Needless graphic. Okay, so then what is the emergency management? So that wasn't really part of the, the emergency versus disaster, but I think it bears some discussion. What is your EM? Is your emergency management just a super fire guy? Nope. Super EMS guy? Nope. Super police guy? Nope. Um, just I'll, off, off the slide here a second. Uh, the one thing that was very clear to me when I first came in from the fireside and became an emergency manager, I was dealing with uh, uh, working with the planning with our utility services folks. And uh, I'm not sure if this is in, in common um, uh, circles, common to the utilities and to the town guys. But what the utility guys told us, our infrastructure guys told us in Saskatoon is, who does the public call when there's an emergency? Well, simple, they call the fire department. Hey. And, they, and then the guy says, so when you're having a problem, who do you call? I guess utilities. <laughs> so really, if you're thinking about it, the most important piece of your town, uh, when your fire department is overwhelmed, your utility services in your town are probably play a pretty critical role. So we all play a critical role. My point here isn't to elevate utility services over fire, or elevate fire over EMS. My point is, is that there's not one link in the chain that's more important than the rest. It's all important right from the right from the explosion, right to the counselor. So what is emergency management? Big long definition, what I wanted to point out there was the three or the four colored words. We analyze, we plan, we help, making, help make decisions, and we manage resources. So if your EOC in your mind, your emergency operations center in your mind is some place where people can, in a nice, warm, sterile environment with donuts and coffee, start to tell the fire chief how to do business, you're wrong. Your EOC is not about tactics. Can't be. Your EOC is about supporting what's happening in the field. And that's the other challenge, is if your fire chief doesn't know to, re to, to update your EOC and your EOC doesn't know what their roles and responsibilities are, there's going to be conflict, there's going to be tension, there's going to be inefficiencies. The purpose of the EOC is to help analyze. So on a regular basis, and in chaos mode, that's kind of the term we've adopted, in chaos mode when the, you're keeping, you're on, you keep on discovering new information about the emergency, oh, we didn't know that that was on fire, put that on the board, didn't, didn't know this was flooded, put that on the board. And once you get past the point where you're discovering new information, you've kind of accelerated through chaos mode. Whew, okay, now what are we dealing with? As you're discovering these things, you're continually responding and still dealing with them, but as you're discovering things, you really can't, you can't plan. You can't get into your planning phase. You're in a reaction phase. So when we get into the point in the emergency, maybe 14 hours in, 10 hours in, where the situation is somewhat stable, it's not changing. It's still bad, but it's not changing. You understand what's going on. You're dealing with it. That's when you can start to analyze. What's the impact? What's going to happen in two days if we don't fix it? What's going to happen tomorrow morning if we don't fix it? What's going to happen right now if we don't fix it? But unless you analyze, unless you have the ability to analyze in your emergency operations center, your fire chief and police chief will just keep on responding, keep on spraying water, keep on whatever they're doing. And that may be the best thing, but it might be the worst thing. Maybe the dollar value of what they're spraying water on isn't all that great. But the damage of continually spraying water on the infrastructure or the damage on other, other things, maybe that's going to be more, uh, more of a significant problem than just letting that particular you know, first damaged asset burn. So we have, to make, we have to analyze, what are we trying to do? How much water are we spraying? Where is the water going? How long will it pool there? What's it going to affect in two days? We have to move ourselves from an emergency to a construction problem. We have to take this out of the hands of the police and fire department and give it to the hands of your local engineers. That's what you're trying to do. There's got to be this natural tension. Let the fire guys do what fire guys are doing, but you're trying to pull that away from them as, 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 as seamlessly and as, as firmly as possible and put it in the hands of the engineers because that's how you get your community back to normal. Fire guys can't get communities back to normal. Police guys can't do that. They can help you solve the chaos mode, 
but you need to be there right, there right alongside, right from the beginning, so you can move this from a fire problem into an engineering problem. So we'll help analyze, help you plan. What, what's involved in planning? There's some mundane details. The devil's in the details. You have an abnormal situation, 20 or 30 more people than you normally would have fighting a fire or dealing with an emergency. Who's going to feed them? Where do they park? Who's, who's going to compensate them for their time? Is that part of your plan? Who's going to know if they're on site or if they've gone home? Who's going to do that check-in, check-out business? You've got a plan. You've got to have some, you can't just keep on, oh my God, we just discovered something else. Let's all run over here now. There is an element for that. But when you get into a disaster, a long, a long evolving event, we have to get away from that thinking. We have to move toward planning. We have to be able to analyze, plan, make appropriate decisions. And I'm not going to be very popular with the folks that raised their hand that they were elected officials. And I understand the reality. In a lot of towns, the elected officials are the ones doing pretty much everything. I get that. But if you can get an emergency operations center that doesn't have to have your elected officials in there, don't get your elected officials in there. You need sober second thought. So your emergency operations center should be your middle management that takes the information from the field, can summarize it, display it, pass it on, make recommendations to a secondary body called your policy group where your elected officials can say, yeah, we check off on that. Yes, we can go to the government. We can start you know, asking for more support on that. We don't really talk about that too much. We tend to think that our emergency operations center has everybody who's got a shirt and tie and doesn't want to get their, get their feet muddy. No, there should be an operations center that has that middle management people that can take information, summarize, analyze, plan, and if they need to get permission, there's a policy group. So do, do all your elected officials have to be out of the EOC? I think that that would be impractical. But at the same point in time, I think what you need to do is you need to intentionally take, and you're a bad example um, because you're a fire guy, but you're also a counselor, but take you out of the EOC and say, tomorrow morning, you're going to come to the policy, you're going to get briefed, you're going to give us your feeling on what, what's going on, and then you're going to go away. Or you're going to stay in the policy group, but you're not coming into the EOC. That is probably the most powerful position to be in, not because you're elected official, but because you're not looking at all the granular details. You're not getting distracted with the granular details. Being able to have that sober second thought, having that, having that backup to a backup. So you've got your field operators, you've got your EOC making, making uh, decisions to support, and then when that gets past a certain dollar figure or you know, things are politically kind of getting sensitive, you come up with your plan suggestions and you say to the people in the policy group, your mayor or your, whoever you got, say, Do you guys, are you guys okay with this? All right, good, we're good to go. And they can go off and they can make all their excuses and they can start doing their media stuff and whatever they got to do, and then we can get back to work and support the site. That middle management piece, that EOC, should be moving the small levers and the elected officials in the policy group should be pushing the big levers, making, up, making, the, uh, making the approvals. So emergencies, just to, re just to rehash, because this is the key. You want to know what you can do to make your response system better today? Know the difference between an emergency and a disaster. An emergency is routine for people in uniform. That's what you pay them for. It's what you equip them for. It, re it requires prompt coordination. That's what they do. Disasters are abnormal situations that require prompt, and, um, uh, prompt um, coordination but exceed normal capacity. And when you have those situations, you probably need to have an emergency operations center opened up to support them making those decisions. Do you understand the difference between those and know what the purpose of emergency management is? Emergency management is not to tell a fire chief what to do. It's to support what the fire chief wants to do. Really, it's information management. So in that little green shield there, you've got your police, fire, and EMS. And I couldn't find a little thing for utilities, otherwise I would have put it in there, but I want to give them a special nod. They're part of the team which is one of the reasons why I'll talk about training later, one of the reasons why we're really pushing for incident command training. I think everybody needs incident command training because it gives you the ability to take those people that are normally used to dealing with emergencies, people in uniform, it gives them the, the language and the ability to work with the non-uniform responders of your community. If you don't have ICS, it's a really difficult kind of a, uh, difficult to kind of do ongoing meaningful work with uh, non-uniform responders. So you've got your little green shield of 
of your emergency responders. The emergency is happening, and uh, let's see if my graphic, I'm not very good with PowerPoint, but wait for it, I'm building up the anticipation. Um, these things happen, the uh, emergency responders can handle those things, they're dodging or they're, they're, they're deflecting those bullets, but then every once in a while the thing just is either too big for your, for your public safety shield or just you just weren't planning for it or weren't prepared for it, and when it gets past that little buffer of emergency services, then that's what causes disasters in your community. And for the city of Saskatoon, I'm not a Garth Brooks fan, I never will be now, but the Garth Brooks concert in Saskatoon was a close disaster for us. And you say, how? Well, we died. Nope. But do you know that from, the, um, uh, from 42nd Street to the, uh, the SaskTel Center, when that was bumper to bumper traffic, your ability to get cell phone service was extremely compromised. And we anticipated that, that that section of road could handle about a quarter of the traffic that was going to be on there. So if we have people that are getting frustrated because they're stopped and they're going to get out and they're going to park on the side of the road and walk and get picked off by a car, we couldn't guarantee anyone would get 911 service. So if we know that and we put our head in the sand, now we're in a, in a true disaster. So we, we, we plan for that. So I guess when we're talking about community risks, Things like events in your community could actually put your community at risk and you need to be able to plan for those. So anybody that's got the, the Briar coming to a small, or the Scotties coming to a small town, you know, large, large events in, in the middle of summertime that are gonna be outside that bring in lots of people, those scare the heck out of me because that's, now you're in tornado season, you're typically gonna be in a spot that's got poor entrance and egress, all these things that could happen from an environmental perspective and you've got people that don't live in your town that are in your town and expecting that you're going to be there to help them with all their needs. Large events should be considered to be things to plan around, not to overreact to, but things to be prepared for from an emergency perspective. Let's talk about planning. The second element of the three that, that, that we're going to go through today. Okay, so what we'll, talk about is we'll talk about these two um, bullet points. We'll talk about the impacts of disaster. We'll talk about community vulnerability. So we will talk about that on subsequent slides. But I want to take a second for a couple of things that are important, but I'm not going to delve into. You've got to plan for a much longer response. You all, all know the story of the Pavlovian kind of Pavlov and his dog. Ring the bell, the dog salivates. Fire guys are the same way. EMS guys are the same way get the alarm, we're gonna be there for two hours maximum, we get back and there's gonna be burgers, it's a, it's, a, it's a miracle. Every time someone's house burns down, I come back to the hall and I got burgers, or donuts or something. It's, oh, I'm so hungry, boy, I'm fighting a fire, man, I'm getting hungry, it's, yeah, it's about two hours. The thing about a disaster is, is that these are long-term events. These are abnormal, they're not what we typically train for. And so when you're talking about a normal, then longer response, you have to think about the impact on your responders, both in the field and in your um, operations center. And for those of you that do exercises for your, for your EOC, congratulations, that's great. But try doing this. Try doing an emergency exercise in your, in your EOC that simulates changing from day to day. So maybe you've got seven people on your committee. Do an exercise with three people walk them through, give them inputs, and give them all the things that they need to make decisions on, see how they capture the information in their EOC, then have them walk out and have a, a fresh group come in that needs to be able to operate in that emergency only with the information that's in the room. So when we're talking about longer duration events in the field, we're talking about challenges to mutual aid. We're talking about challenges to volunteer firefighters that have to go back and they've got to teach school the next day. Who's, if they're not going to teach school, what's the impact on that? Longer duration events have an impact on responders. But longer duration events also have an impact on your EOC because you'll find that there's not a lot of people in your community that can work in your EOC. And if you do have an EOC open, you probably have a situation where you're going to be there for 36 to 48 hours, minimum. Your EOCs aren't there for a two-hour call. So what does it look like in your operations center to be able to have people that are, need to be filling that space and making decisions for 48 hours? Is, is it the same people? You look in most of uh, the research nowadays, we tend to start making bad decisions after about 12 to 14 hours. 
And if it's really chaos mode, you can probably really cut that down. In chaos mode where decisions are coming at you all the time, you're not going to be able to make good decisions for even that long. So we're talking about long duration events. Think about the impacts in both those at the field and in your operations center level. And the, and, and the answer to the operations center level is you do incident command. If you use incident command, it's much easier to have the province come in and provide you support because that's what we do. So we can come in and we can start to fill some of the more minor roles, but give your people some, some sleep and give them some breaks. So incident command is pretty important. The other thing is, and I mentioned this before in the previous slide, I want to circle back to it, is how and, or sorry, when and how do you escalate? So this is one of those things where uh, we're talking about how do you make your community better today? Really, really try to focus on what are your trigger points for moving it from a fire emergency to an emergency that fire needs to be there, but there also needs to be an EOC support. So when, what are the trigger points? And then how, you know, how are, is it just a cell phone call? Okay, it's probably the easiest thing. Um, but then who and uh, what will they do with that? So uh, when and how? So make sure you plan for longer than normal responses and make sure you plan for how do you escalate. If you don't plan for those things, it's that, that stuff doesn't just happen. That stuff needs to be thought about. All right, let's talk about impacts of disasters. And uh, typically, this isn't, this isn't really popular thinking. When you have a fire chief that gets a brand new fire truck, the fire chief's not going to get up to council and to the public and say, this is a great fire truck, it's going to do this, but we're still in a lot of trouble when it comes to disasters. Your fire, your fire chief's going to tell you how much safer you are, how much better the system's going to be, and absolutely, but that doesn't mean anything about disasters. If you bought 10 fire trucks last year for your community, a disaster means you needed 12. If you bought 12, you needed 14. If you bought four, it's, it's a zero-sum game. You're not going to catch up to that e equation. So when we're talking about the impacts of disasters, we have to know what we need to invest in. And I would suggest that Dennis Maletti, who is a well-known researcher in emergency management, and this is a dated study, but, I, but it still stands. From 1975 to 1994, natural disasters killed 315 people per year in the States. So in Canada, we're about a tenth of that, if you use the typical US to uh, uh, Canadian statistics. 315 people for natural disasters died. So are, should we be focused as planners, as elected officials, should we be looking at disasters as a life safety issue? It's a really, really sensitive topic. Every life that is lost from a disaster is a tragedy, yes. But we have to think about what we're, who's responsible for emergency planning in our community. Is it just fire? 315 people per year died from natural disasters. So what is that in context? If I tried to take the, the uh, morbidity and uh, mortality weekly tables of a, of a comparable year, I'm not sure why I couldn't find one for 94 or 75, but I couldn't at the time. But I think that the numbers are still pretty accurate. So if you look at 1999, we know that natural disasters killed 315 people in the states per year. In 1999, in one year, motor vehicle collisions killed uh, people 15 years or less almost 2,000 times. Natural disasters killed 315 per year. 15-year-olds or younger died at a rate of almost 2,000 per year. So we're not really going to equate the severity of a natural disaster to a car accident because they happen more often. And that's what your fire departments are geared up for. There's a, there's a need, there's a reason why you've got a fire department that has access to auto extrication. That's a big problem. All right, well, I'm kind of de-escalate what our thinking is about who's responsible for, for emergency, uh, for, for disaster planning. Is it just fire, police, EMS? Play a big role, but only 315 people per year die from that sort of thing. So where's the impact? In that same study, in that same uh, time frame, from 75 to 94, disasters cost approximately $26 billion U.S. per year. And I, I kind of set you up a little bit with that insurance thing this, uh, at the beginning. This isn't an insurance discussion. I'm not saying go out and get more insurance. This isn't about insurance. This is about putting disasters in perspective. If you think disasters are about bodies in the streets, then you have every, 
then, then you're absolutely right about putting the response for disasters on your fire departments, police departments, and EMS services. If you recognize the, the, the few times that people will die from disasters, natural disasters, in Canada and in the States, and you look at the monetary impact, your thinking should shift from the emergency management is about getting more fire department support to community support. Community support. Not just fire support, community support. So in Cuba, I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, but please trust me when I say Cuba shares the same Gulf waters as what Florida does. The amount of monetary loss from hurricanes in Cuba with adjusted dollars compared to the states is a fraction. Absolute fraction. Why is that? A lot of the monetary damage from hurricanes come from storm surge, come from water. We all like our man caves. Got our big flat screen TVs, subwoofers on the floor, family heirlooms, all our stuff in boxes in the basement stuck in corners and here comes the water and what happens? Oh, that's an insurance claim, that's an insurance claim, that's an insurance claim. So in the States, they plan through having insurance. Not just, but it's oversimplification, but you see where I'm going with that. In Cuba, when, tur when hurricane season is kind of percolating, what they do is, as, a com as communities, they go in, they take all their valuables, take them on from the main floor to the second floor. They, beginning of each school season, all the kids get hurricane response lessons. I don't know what that means, but there's a whole program on how to, how, to, how to survive and how to, you know, go home and make sure your parents recycle while also go home and make sure your parents are hurricane ready. So if we're talking about recognizing risks in our community, no matter what they are, and we recognize that from a natural disaster perspective, only, only a small percentage of the impact from a disaster is lives lost, and a vast majority of the impact in disasters is the monetary impact, what can we do as communities to be more prepared? Educate your communities. What could happen in your community how can you respond to that? How can you minimize your losses? Maybe a backup generator for your fridges. If you have a lot of meat in your fridges, as crazy as it sounds, and the power is fluctuating, maybe you need to promote people to get backup fridges or some type of, you know, some type of monetary management with that. <coughs> emergency response, sorry, emergency response is cool. Disaster responses should be kind of boring. The way you make your biggest impact is in educating your community. Do you have any school teachers in the room? I know there's a couple. Don't raise your hands. I know you're shy. Parents of, the, of school kids are, you know, you can be brain surgeons, you can be rocket scientists, you can be the most brilliant people, but when little Johnny and Sally is in harm's way, you just, you're, all your decision making is just out the window. A lot, of, a lot of bad decisions result in a lot of bad impacts. How do you make your community safer? Do your parents actually read the, the, the school board's emergency plan when it comes home, when they, in the beginning, the beginning of the school year every year, little Johnny and Sally come home and say, this is what, a, what our emergency, or this is what the school board is gonna do in case of emergency or in case of power outages or whatever. Do you read that? Because if you don't, when that occurs and you're in, uh, at work 40, 40 minutes away or across town, and all of a sudden you panic because you heard something on Twitter or uh, on the media, and you don't know how the, how the school's gonna react, you're gonna fly back to the school to go rescue Johnny and Sally. That is a, and there's studies to prove it. When people do that, they make the problem worse. Your school boards are extremely good at taking care of your kids. They're as motivated to take care of your kids as you are to take care of your kids. They have a plan for that. Minimize the disaster impacts on your community by encouraging parents to understand how the school boards deal with emergencies, make better decisions. Other things that could make better decisions are, do you know how to reunify with your family? So cell phone towers go down, I can't phone my kid to see if he's gonna be home, it's stormy outside, power's out. If I can't do that, oh, I'm gonna get in the car, I'm gonna, dri I'm gonna drive around, I'm gonna go look for my kid. And I get stuck in the middle of the road, now the plows can't go, and then when the plows can't go, no one else can drive. What's your family reunification plan? Simple things that, from an education perspective in your community, can really do a lot to decrease the financial impact, which is the bulk of what, emer of what emergency management's about. I'm not saying there isn't anxiety that goes along with these dollars. 
People will be anxious and they'll be scared, but they're typically not going to be making life or death decisions. They're going to be making decisions that just make the overall problem worse. So what can we do? The purpose of this um, session is how can we be better prepared in our community to, to mitigate and to manage emergencies, personal preparedness. We'll talk a bit about that in the wrap up. All right, so point number one, I think I've made it, but um, I'm gonna make it again with the video. Point number one is emergency responders fill a critical role for community response of a disaster, but they're not the end all. All right, firefighters, settle down. How about the budget? Balances. And the taxes. One page or less. Anyone want better roads? We do. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Done. A lot of paper to tell us we need clean water. Need clean water, guys? Aye. All right, this is the easiest job I've ever had. We're out of here. Get more done now. Communicate with groups in less than a second with Nextel Direct Connect. Only on the NOW network. So firefighters and emergency services play a role but they're not the ones that you need to help you with the, the vast majority of the work, which is recovery. So is your community prepared to jump in and do the heavy lifting after the chaos mode is done? I don't think so, because I know mine isn't. So when we talk about, you know, everyone got a role to play, absolutely. Fire department has a role to play in the, in the early onset of the emergency. And what we need to do is make sure that they know when to reach out to the emergency planning committee, how to reach out to the emergency planning committee, and the emergency planning committees have to be ready to kind of come in and support both at the site level for the emergency responders, but they also have to be able to support the community, which is my second point. So community leadership can't just rely on fire departments. You've got to also be able to be prepared to escalate your activities to support first responders during response and the community during response and recovery. And that includes things about passing information to the public, what is going on, what isn't going on. It, that isn't just, you know, those needy people that just need information all the, all the time. We need to actually consider that to be one of, our, um, one of our, our core services in the EOC, is giving the public up-to-date, regular information. It never used to be like that. It is now. Information management is critical. You need to be able to, to give people clean water or alternatives to clean water. You need to be able to give them, uh, making sure that um, education isn't impacted. One of the, the most impactful stories that I had, I've, I've ever had in emergency management came from the city of Minot. I think it was in the early 2000s. I don't remember when the big floods was, or at least one of the big floods. But I remember seeing this picture uh, from a helicopter of a football field. And this football field was obviously underwater. I don't know how much it was. You could still see the lines, but it was really murky, gross water. And um, uh, one, of the, um, one, of the, one of the emergency managers there was saying, yeah, that was a, that was a really that was really um, hard on the school system. I said, yeah, football field, yeah, whatever. No, think about this. In the States, they have a program that they call, I'm not sure we do it here, but in the States, they have a program they call red shirting. And so if you have a really big seventh grade kid that's a little bit athletic, if that kid's good at football, what they'll do is they'll intentionally hold that kid back a little bit, give him more football experience within the primary and the high school years, so that when he gets to be uh, graduating high school, he's this big buff adult that can go into college and clean up. It's called redshirting. So that particular um, emergency, that Minot emergency, happened in this one kid's year, grade 12 year. So he's just going into grade 12. He'd been redshirted. Well, the football program that he was involved with at his high school was completely wiped out. In fact, the football program in the entire community was wiped out. So this kid had been held back for two or three years in preparation for college, and he's not gonna get drafted unless he's got a stellar grade 12 year. He's, there's a lot of pressure on here. So in terms of the flood, we're thinking of a football field, we're thinking of you know getting back into classes and moldy books. This kid and his family were faced with a decision, do we send our kid to school in a neighboring community for the year, so on the off chance, he, he's gonna get this, this football scholarship. Disasters, they may be more monetary rather than life safety, but disasters have a tremendous impact on family units. So I'm not saying disasters aren't impactful. They're tremendously impactful in ways that we'll never understand. So we have to take them seriously. We have to be prepared to support our community in terms of information, water, education, our first responders before and after. I'm interested, you know, you've got the SISM component. Our first responders are under a tremendous amount of stress, and so are families. 
What are we doing to manage the stress level of people after the emergency is over? I'm not sure if you know this or not, but uh, in a floods, in the, in the Red River floods, um, guys are the worst. I'm not a feminist by any stretch of the imagination, but guys are the worst. Um, this one study with, uh, uh, with, uh, with the Red River floods shows that women tend to react to the, to the signs of, uh, of impending danger much sooner than men. So they'll listen to the weather report and say, honey, maybe we should get the boxes out of the basement. Nah, it's all good. It hasn't flooded here in years. It'll be fine. No problem. Then the rain starts. Honey, maybe we should do this. Nah, I'll do it tomorrow. It's no big deal. That's nah, okay. So the, 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 the wife has been having the stress right from the earliest suggestion that, that, that there could be rain. Guy's blown it off. Now, Al, his dad's been here for 25 years. That never floods on this area. Now, nah, don't worry about it. Then the flood occurs. Now the woman, and this is all part of this research, wants to help get the precious heirlooms out of the basement into the main floor. Nope, honey, I'm a hero. Women and children first. You guys get to go to the reception center. I'll take care of this. And the stress level of having the guy know what to take out of the basement and what to solve and what to salvage, that's stress. Now the guy, all he has to do is worry about, now oh, I've got to take from a Braxis set, get some box out of the basement. He's not stressed. He's just working hard. Okay, so it doesn't stop there, though. No, it doesn't. So now the, 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 the woman in the family unit, if they have kids, is in this reception center trying to manage these little brats that are now don't have, they, they don't have school, they don't have, their, they don't have their, their, uh, their traditional routines, and they're maybe a bit too much of that orange juice from McDonald's, and they're just going bananas. Now she's dealing with that, he's just moving boxes. He comes back for lunch, he takes, after lunch, he goes back out to the house. I'm not making this up, this is in the research. So is it just identifying points of stress? No. The outcomes of disasters on family units is an incredibly high rate of divorce. So when we're looking at disasters, we can't stop thinking about the fact of, we, we can't put all of our thinking, all of our response in the fire department, police department, ambulance service, utility service basket. As a community, we all have a role to play. We need to have that escalating understanding of when is it outside, when is it abnormal, when does the police and fire, when do they need to reach out to EM, what is EM going to do with that next, that next bit of, now they've been activated, now what are they going to do? And as a community, we need to think about all the impacts of disaster. It's not just about lives, not, sorry, not just about injuries, not just about death and dying, it's about lives. So what can we do to make our communities better? approach disasters from a community perspective, not just a first responder perspective, because you're only getting a fraction. If you, if you try to bolster your first response, you're only getting a fraction of what you need for community response. All right, let's talk about ourselves for a second. When you use the word vulnerability, it, that can be pretty comfortable, actually. Most of us in, in this room, we have, our, we have pretty good lives. When we talk about vulnerability, it's, equal, it's e easy to look across and see you know, children at risk in developing countries. That's vulnerable. Yeah, it's not me. It makes me feel pretty good. We can look at people that are um, uh, homeless or maybe vulnerable from a social, it's not me. I feel pretty good. I'm not vulnerable. And you can look at you know, the, the, uh, the, the physically uh, vulnerable, uh, mobility challenges, English as a second language, inability to hear, speak, any, anything you can think of. Yeah, you know what? Let's call that vulnerable. I, I, I'm, I'm okay. I'm not vulnerable. But the fact is, is that we are vulnerable. This one study uh, by a guy named Lopez, again, it's a bit dated. It was from the um, uh, late 90s, called Public Perception of Disaster Preparedness Using Presentations Using Disaster Images. So as typical academics, they make a big, long sentence about something that could be a lot, lot shorter. What they ended up doing is over three areas, he had, um, I think, 15 or 20 different grad students. And in uh, Tornado Alley, Tornado Alley would have been the Midwest, and uh, so he had a group of students go that way. He had a group of students go down and down the Mississippi Valley uh, along all the flood, flood plains down there, uh, do this uh, same research down there. And then he had some go to the West Coast in earthquake, in the earthquake prone zones. And so the, the premise of this, he was a little bit, a little bit sneaky. Uh, the premise was of this is bring people in in an evening. Um, uh, before the actual presentation, you would ask them some questions. You know, if you live in Tornado Alley, do you know what to do? Oh, yeah, I know what to do. Then they'd show them um, pictures of different things that could happen in a tornado, then would ask them some questions afterwards. So it was, it was to help them get prepared, certainly, but it was to measure their 
um, attitudes. So it was to help them get to prayer, uh, get prepared, but it was primarily to measure their attitudes. So with the three different students, three different groups, sorry, going to Tornado Alley, Flood Alley, Earthquake Zone, they asked people who participated, um, I'm not sure if you can see it in the back, but there was 1,000 people in the one area, 2,000 people in the other area, about 1,300 in the, in the third area, so good, good sample size. Asked people in the Tornado Alley area, would you know what to do? 65% said, I would know what to do. No hesitation. I would know what to do. Positive. Uh, in Tornado Alley, 21% said, yeah, I'm pretty sure I'd know what to do. And only 9% said, I wouldn't know what to do. So if you add the, I think I would, with I would, you're talking about 94% of the population in Tornado Alley said, we would know what to do or have a good idea. That's awesome. Flood, about the same, about 90%, 80 some percent. And earthquake, about 95%. These are really good, this is a good indication. 95% <laughs> of the people would probably know what to do. Well, let's look at the results. So when asked specific questions after the presentation, specific question was, would you know how to turn off electricity? Remember, 97% of people said they would. 27% in Tornado said they actually would know how to turn off electricity. 97% thought they would. 27% did know. In the flood area, in terms of electricity, only 28%. In the earthquake area, 35%. So what people think they know and what they don't know is pretty important. People think that they're more prepared than what they are. People are vulnerable. You are people. So what can we do to decrease our vulnerability or, de or, or, or uh, uh, enhance our emergency preparedness in our community? Consider our own vulnerabilities. And I'll just kind of go through the rest of this list. So would they know how to turn off the gas? Whereas 27% in the Toronto Alley thought they would know how to turn off the uh, electricity, only 12% thought they would know how to turn off the gas. 14% in flood would know how to turn off the gas, 36%. Basically, the folks in California were the best prepared. They, they thought they would know what to do, and for the most part, they, did, they, they wouldn't know what to do in all the categories. But it's still dramatic. Over half of the people that said that they would know what to do, oh, well over half, had no clue what to do. We are vulnerable. So how are we vulnerable? Look at the elements in your lives and do some self-reflection. Do you rely on water? If water's not gonna be there, what are you gonna do? Do you rely on electricity? If electricity's not gonna be there, what are you gonna do? Do you have pets? If you can't be there for your pets, what are you gonna do? Do you have livestock? Do you have, a, do you have an ongoing economic concern? If you can't get water or whatever the impacts could be, What's your backup plan? Do you have family? Do you have a family reunification plan? How are you going to get together? How are you going to be able to manage everyone's needs? Do you have um, um, adult, uh, adults in your lives that you're responsible for, for caring for? All these things are great, and they just by looking at those pictures it would show that you've got a fulsome life and you're really enjoying yourself. That's awesome. But when your routine is disrupted, what does that mean in terms of your preparedness? Because each one of those things will make you make a bad decision. Each one of those things will, will make you drive into harm's way. Cause more damage to your vehicles, to your cars. Maybe you're only 315 people per year die from natural disasters. So chances are, and you don't want to take that chance, I get it, but chances are people are safe with where they are. But how do you make sure your family is back together? What's your plan for that? And when we're talking about disasters, I think you know every every May is Emergency Preparedness um, Week, first week in May. You probably <laughs> probably knew that. And the me the message for the last 20 years, 25 years, has been: Are you prepared for 72 hours? Well, now they're thinking even go longer than that. Which we can't get people to buy into 72 hours. I don't know how we're going to actually extend the message, but the reality is 72 hours isn't enough. Let me give you an example of what 72 hours looks like. Do you guys remember um, Hurricane Katrina, right? Remember Geraldo Rivera? Were you guys ever, you guys watch TV when Geraldo was on? All right, so I don't remember the exact timing, but I just want to give you a sense of what 72 hours looks like. From the time the tornado hit, and when, oh, sorry, hur hurricane, from the time the hurricane hit, all the pre-warnings had been given. People that could leave did leave, people that believed would leave. So it wasn't that people didn't have an understanding that something was coming. So all that preparation phase, 
and then the hurricane hits. From the time the hurricane hit to the time Geraldo Rivera was in front of the Superdome talking about people getting killed and raped and babies getting eaten and whatever else he was spinning up in his little mind there. And as he was talking, the National Guard was pulling in. That was 72 hours. So from going from a, a well-heeled group of people in a nice, comfortable room, you take away everyone's water, food, don't give them information about what's the next steps, people will start to make up their own realities. People will start to react in ways that you can't anticipate. Information flow is key. How do, you in, how do you inform people? But anyways, that's the 72 hours. That's what can happen in 72 hours. And I've never been able to track this down as a truism. I think it's true, but I've never been able to actually lock it down. But apparently, MI5 in England says anarchy is three meals away. Now, I've never been able to track it down if that's a true thing or not, but it's in emergency planning circles, it's kind of what we kind of talk about. Anarchy is three meals away. I'm not sure if you know this or not, but in the city of Saskatoon, there's three days' worth of food in the city of Saskatoon. So if you go to the grocery stores and all the, the warehouses and stuff, there's three days' worth of food in Saskatoon. So we need to recognize our vulnerabilities. We need to recognize the elements of our vulnerabilities and be prepared for those things so that when a disaster hits, we're not thinking about disasters just being death and dying and fire department will take care of that. We look at things in terms of our personal family unit, we look at things in terms of our community committees, how do we actually prepare ourselves to support and how do we, uh, how do we uh, aid our communities in, uh, in survival and in, in, in fact in recovery. So these courses that I'll talk about, I won't get, it, I won't get too deep because I'm, I want to leave time for questions. Um, I've only got a few slides left. I'm not suggesting that these courses by themselves will, you take a course and boom, you're going to be much more prepared. These courses are really compass points. You take these, these courses and it gives you a chance to take that information, work within your community and use the information to make your community safer. So I don't want to say take these courses and you're safe. I want to say take these courses and be prepared to apply them to your community. So we're talking about the different courses that are available. Uh, there's radio training courses. Uh, you'd be surprised at how many folks that carry radios don't know how to use all the features of a radio. So if they, don't, if they can't get to a radio tower, they could still turn a channel and go simplex radio to radio. Some people don't know that, and as soon as you have that type of problem, then essentially your radio communication bogs down. So take some PPSTN radio. I don't know what PPSTN stands for. I always forget. But take your, your radio training, uh, and that's through my organization. Sask Alert is a great way to inform public. I think I've tried to give you some stories on how to inform public, and I see some smiles there. So yeah, we can certainly answer some questions on that. The incident command system. Uh, within the province of Saskatchewan, I can tell you very, very happily that we're moving toward incident command and we're actually making great strides toward incident command. Incident command is not just fire. Incident command is how you do business in the EOC as well. So think about incident command training. Uh, at the very bottom there, sorry about the, 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 the pixels weren't the same on my computer as they're on the, on the, on the projector. Um, at the very bottom there, there's the emergency center, operations center training. Uh, right now we're just, um, my organization is just in the process of redoing how we are going to support your EOCs in your communities. Once we have that training program out, we would love everyone to take that training program. So we're, we're calling it EOC in a box, that when our guys roll up in the trucks, they can un unfold some of the stuff out of their trucks and come and support your EOCs if you're using ICS. If you're not using ICS, then our stuff won't work for you. So you need to, you know, you need to think about taking some incident command training and then, and then top it off with some EOC training. Basic emergency management gives you a good sense of what you should be doing in the, in the planning phase, in the response phase, in the recovery phase, and in the mitigation phase. So those are the four pillars of emergency management, planning, mitigation, response, and recovery. Don't always happen in that order, but it gives you a good sense of the activities that, that should take place. And then there's even a course that we're redoing now. Um, it's more of a workshop. If you don't have an emergency plan or your emergency plan has been a few years old and, and maybe could do more than just getting refreshed, it could be changed. Then this 10 steps for emergency plan, uh, plan development would be for you. Uh, we're breaking it down. We used to deliver it as a 150-page PDF and drop it on your desk and say good luck to you. But now what we're saying is that's the good information to have. That's your kind of your planning bible. But we want to be able to, to we we want to be able to develop three workshops to be able to get you to use the information. So we'll get you the workshops. You'll do homework between the workshops, and by the time you're done, um, and you'll have a, a product at the end of each workshop. 
So even if you just take the first workshop, you'll get a product that, that you can use. We want everything, everything that you do to engage with us, we want there to be a meaningful outcome at the end of that meeting. So um, we're working on that. So there's some great training that's available to you. Uh, it's not generic. You just can't take ICS and then go home to your hometown and say, here's an ICS manual. That's what we're doing. It's a, it's a method. It's a management system. But you need to be able to you know, take the information, know how to apply it, and then start, um, start uh, uh, applying it uniquely to your community because every community is a bit unique. We can help you with that, but my point is the training programs are important, but it's the application for each community that's going to be a little bit different. So how do you actually make this wonderful stuff happen? You can take your training programs um, through my organization. You can uh, contact your district emergency services operator. There's uh, 10 different districts in the province of Saskatchewan. Um, I don't know if you know your ESO, but there's, uh, like I say, there's 10 different folks and they're all very, very good. And you can contact them through that phone number right there or through our website. So I, I'd, be, I'd be tickle pink if this, uh, if this session resulted in a few more training sessions on our schedule. Typically, we don't do any training in what we call operational season, so we stop training uh, in April and we start training again in fall. Uh, just to make room for the fire and flood season that we typically have every year. So if you're looking, and I think for most rural communities that, that, that isn't too much of a hardship. So we typically train over top of winter. So if you're thinking about training, start thinking about next year. Give us a call soon and then we'll try to organize. I uh, believe that's the last slide that I have. Oh yeah, sorry, here's the wrap up. So if you had no idea what I was saying and you just kind of dial back in now, so this is, this is the appropriate time. Three things for you to do if my slide works. You can see it's both, there we go. Three things. Consider the difference between emergency and disaster because that forces you to think past your fire department. What's the difference between emergency and disaster? You want to think about training for your whole community not just for fire services. And you also want to, don't want to forget about yourself. You can have wonderful plans, you can have wonderful staff in place, equipped very well, and if they don't have personal preparedness, they won't be at work when you need them. So we need to think about the personal, personal preparedness because you are all an asset in your community, and if you're completely unable to respond because you haven't been personally prepared, then your community is that much more vulnerable. So those are my three points. I'd be happy to take any questions. It's just starting. You guys got four more days of this. If you guys are already asleep, I feel bad. Yes. Sure. Well, thank you very much. Won't, uh, won't make this awkward. Thank you. I suspect if any of you think about it over the next few minutes and uh, come up with a question, he's going to be around because he is doing the second session as well. Thank you very much, Ray, for coming and joining us. Uh, I had actually thought we were fairly well organized because our communities had a couple of emergencies that now I gather we should have called disasters. And uh, they got handled. We work on our plan fairly often, take a good look at what, what worked, what didn't work, how to make it work. And uh, I appreciate the fact that some of the things that we're doing don't seem like the typical emergency measures activities, but I think in light of what you're saying, uh, they, they were very valuable. One example, when we had no power for many days, blizzard for uh, just shy of 48 hours, and then the temperature went up to plus eight, and we had severe flooding, one of the activities that we did, a group of people, one of them was our emergency measures manager, but a lot were just volunteers, 
went door to door to every home in our community to make sure that some who are, were perhaps more vulnerable than others were being cared for and were, were in a safe environment. So we all need to be thinking about it. We all need to be looking at it. I do appreciate the fact, Ray, that you came and presented this today. I appreciate the fact that you shared with us some personal kinds of things as well. Uh, you will have a thank you card on behalf of SUMA as a token of our appreciation. I would like to again thank Chappelle and thank our introducer. Thank all of you for joining us today. The presentations will be available on the YouTube channel, I would suspect probably the latter part of February. And there will be a refreshment break and it is sponsored by 13 Ways. And after that, we'll be starting the second round of education sessions. Enjoy the rest of the convention. Thank you. Thank you.